above all types of bird shooting sits driven wild birds. When I was offered the chance to go on my first wild pheasant and partridge day, I was more excited than any Christmas or birthday of my life. <laughs> For those that don't know, getting a harvestable surplus of wild game on an estate takes a lot of work. You need perfect habitat, great land management, and then be lucky with the weather to even think of having one shoot day a season. Today, the air crackled with a different kind of energy as we gathered in the yard. This is a true celebration of nature's bounty, an appreciation of years of hard work by the gamekeeper, and it most definitely was gonna be a day to remember. Is it fair to say the wild birds are the best at what we do? I certainly think it's the easiest way to explain to people that what we do is a good thing. You were once a wild bird keeper, once upon a time in the dark ages. Once upon a time. I'd love to get back to it sometime, you know that. I always have enjoyed it. It's hard to find people that are willing to invest as heavily as you need to invest to make places like this work. That's the reality of it. But the result, which I'm hoping we're gonna to see today, is stuff dreams are made of. Exactly that. There's, you know, it's a different level, isn't it? A little bit foggy this morning. Hopefully it'll blow out soon. Be able to see some of this beautiful Dorset countryside. A month or so ago, I was chasing partridge across these fields with a pointing dog and Simon. Wild birds don't want to die, and you can very quickly see why they shoot them driven. Because <laughs> chasing after them was, yeah. Oh, this is just a different gravy. It was such a special experience, and to come back here and have this opportunity is pretty mega. I'm so excited. So am I, mate. Let's see if we can go and have a go. See if we can see something. Perhaps be lucky enough to be able to shoot. We grabbed one more coffee over the safety briefing where we were asked to avoid shooting any of the English partridge. Um, it's a little bit misty. And focus our attention on the red legs and pheasants. Could you pick your cartridges up, please? Enjoy your day. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. The five of us pulled peg numbers, booted up, and drove through the fog to the first drive. You guys probably aren't aware of how much of a bucket list moment this is for me. I worked on a wild bird shoot when I was younger. I have obsessed over it since I was young about being involved in this kind of stuff. As Ant said this morning, it's rare. And, and luckily it's an increasingly popular thing for people to take land and manage it in the old ways, the, the correct ways. For those of you who don't know, wild birds don't happen by accident. The majority of game birds in the UK are bred by humans and released into the wild well in advance of the shooting season. A large part of this is due to the fact that over the last century we've seen a dramatic decline in wild partridge and pheasant, mostly to do with the considerable changes in farming and the much increased human population putting pressure and disturbance on the countryside. The last few decades, however, have seen many landowners start to turn back to the old ways, managing their land in a way that will promote both biodiversity and stocks of wild game. Unlike released birds, the quantity of game you can then shoot is dictated by the success of the breeding season, meaning that some years there'll be no shooting at all, and on good years only a few days are possible. This means each bird is worth so much more, not only financially, but as an experience to a game shooter. A wild bird isn't the same as a reared bird. A, a reared bird is pretty dependent on people. A wild bird is too. You know, they, they, as we've said, they're not here by accident, but they don't see a human as the, the, the provider in the same way. Remember when me and Simon were here, it was such a realization to me, and I've hunted wild birds before, but just how much they fear people, just how much they understand that a human isn't the provider is an interesting concept. And yet they're so dependent on us to survive in decent numbers. And you look at places where they're not managed, wild greys aren't managed and aren't cared for. They're not doing as well. But that translates into the way they fly. They fly harder, they fly faster. They live much more on the wing than on the leg, like a reared bird does. There's so many things that now are just pseudo versions of what they were, that to be somewhere where things are 100% real is pretty awesome. Any shoot day would not be possible without a team of great beaters. And as this experienced team finished blanking in and closing in on the final cover, the birds started to fly. Do 
Did I just wipe your eye? You did, my friend, yeah. It kind of snuck round behind me. It was on top of you before you know it. It came out, did exactly what rear game don't do, turned 90 degrees in midair, and it has to fly along the back of the line. Like, what, what game bird even does that? We only saw a handful of game birds. Absolutely fantastic. But I saw a woodcock. Yep. I saw a woodpecker. Yep. I saw a sparrowhawk. I saw a buzzard. I saw a roe deer. We had a red kite. A lot of little brown jobs flying out. So yeah, songbirds and you can songbirds count. everywhere. I mean, it was unbelievable. There's a brown hair run out the corner yeah, and saw ran around the side. Pretty sharp. Yeah, he did, didn't he? It's just phenomenal the amount of wildlife that was actually in that drive. A to proper see nature experience. And yeah, that's a truly. byproduct of all the hard work they do. But it's also part of the day out, right? It's not just oh yeah, we're going to go and stand under some maze, pop, pop, pop. Which again, there's nothing wrong with. No, but it's like level one versus level hundred. It's a different 100. field. We couldn't stop talking about how different these birds flew until we were interrupted thank by you. Mr. Clark for a treat. Oh, thank you very much. Wow. Of course, have I got that? Yeah, we got it. Oh, thank you. What have you got? Thank you very oh, much. Oh. What have you got? What is it? <laughs> You'll see. Hmm? Put it in your mouth. <laughs> oh, it's a shower sweet. <laughs> Gross, I'm mighty. <laughs> You're dealing with real men here. <laughs> Put them out, lad. Don't mm. The keeper made the call to head back to the yard hoping that an hour's wait would give the fog a chance to lift. So we waited. And waited. And waited. Before giving up trying to beat the weather and walking out to the second drive. For me, I think the biggest thing I notice being here is that the sort of correlation you can make between agriculture and habitat management, and conservation, is doesn't take a lot, but it makes a huge difference. I mean, you can see you've got the no spray margins on the edges of the field. You've then got the grass that's not cut, allowed to go tussocky for the birds to hide and shelter in. You've then got the hedges, which are, you know, semi-managed, but also left to develop as they need to. You can see behind me here, we've got this perfect little habitat island that's been left in the middle of an agricultural field. Just a few trees planted, protected from the deer, um, the grass allowed to come as it normally would do. And that just means that when the harvest is going on and the, and the fields are being worked, that those, the, the birds that are here and the ground nesting animals have all got somewhere to go. And it, it, it's a, a small amount of loss agriculturally to create something massive habitat wise. And I just think if we could all do a little bit more of that, everything would do better. Uh, and it's refreshing to see, actually. Very, very refreshing to see. I've drawn a peg on the end here next to JC. I've been given free reign to move up and down a little bit. I'm going to use my professional knowledge here to say that the partridge are going to follow the contours and head down into the dip. I'm going to move down ever so slightly, and it gets me further away from JC, which means he can't poach my birds. So I think we'll move down a little bit and just see. We can always come back up if we need to. In order to have the best chance of having a harvestable surplus of wild birds, there are three things you have to have in place. The first is correct habitat. As Ant explained, you need to manage and farm the land sympathetically, creating an environment where birds and their chicks will thrive. Next is food and water. The third factor is predator control. The modern world makes life pretty easy for generalist predators. Keeping these down to an acceptable level is key to the success of all prey species, especially those that nest on the ground, like pheasants and partridge. As we stood in the fog waiting for the drive to begin, we had none of the usual indicators to see how the drive was developing. We just had to wait patiently for something to emerge from the fog. Oh, Patrick. Oh, it's too low. I can shoot them out the back like that, so if they do that again, I'll shoot them out the back. English. What a cracking little drive for me that was. I mean, the other boys struggled a little bit, but to be stood down here in that dip where I knew they were going to go, set in a beautiful location, Truly wild birds, great shooting, really enjoyed that, amazing. Soil and the dust are trailing behind my boots. 
Well, that was certainly a lot more exciting, mate, wasn't it? Oh, wait, they just come out of nowhere. I know, it's exactly what I just said to Sash. It's that adrenaline buzz, that, that wildness about it. They just, you can't hear anything, you can't see anything, and then they're out. And they don't carry on going where they're going. They come out, they see us, and they turn, and they spun off in another direction. Do you see the English? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I managed to pick a French out from amongst the English. But yeah, there was a beautiful pack of English came through. I've succeeded what I came here to do today, mate. I shot a wild partridge with my gun. I'm as happy as can be. Good man. Every one of us had now fulfilled that bucket list moment of shooting a wild driven bird. The thrill of that shot is undeniable, but it's not a callous act devoid of respect. We shooters understood the delicate balance, investment and hard work that needs to be done for every bird here to exist. Good old man. Oh yeah. And with a few of those precious birds in the bag, it was time for Elevenses. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Elevenses is one of the most crucial parts of the day, used for sharing stories and forging stronger bonds between friends. But wild birds wait for no man, so it was time to head off once more. The next drive was situated on a shallow slope, stood with a big woods to our back, and a great cover plot ahead of us. And more excitingly, the fog had started to lift. The fog has cleared. Cleared enough. You now I have 400 yards of visibility instead of 40. I'm so humbled by having this opportunity to be here and, and be part of a project that, that is this special. It transcends the importance of actually shooting any birds, which is a different feeling altogether. We've discussed in the past that it's, it's not fair to impose your stage of shooting upon someone else. Meaning I might be at, let's say, level 20 out of 100 and this one's a level five and they're, they're on their journey you can't drag people up fast but i really do implore people to i don't know look look beyond the basic and look for more deeper meaning and then the deeper more special sides of what we do you don't need to be killing hundreds of birds to have a good time just to be part of a project like this and to stand here and watch these wild birds and witness the genuine origins of, of what we do is so unbelievably special. And it, it does, it, it humbles you, it takes the bravado and the, the bullshiness that perhaps you usually see on our game shoots away because there is no room for it here. One partridge did break out to my left, came up, rose through the line and shot it out the back. I remember that for a very long time, if not forever. It wasn't super high, it was very fast, but that is a proper top 10 life moment actually we don't go the same places that we used to go we don't ride the same no, we don't ride the same we don't show the same feelings that we used to show you don't smile the same i don't smile the same we don't do the same things that we used to do we don't vibe the same we don't vibe the same no i ain't never i ain't never Here's another one, here's another one. That's all ants. It's amazing when the birds are more special each, that the quantity doesn't matter. I think lots of unspecial birds versus a few very special birds is it's an interesting metric, right? I am lost for words. To pick up my shells, pick up my birds, and just digest it all as an experience. Every drive was exceptional and very different. This one, now that we could see the birds, the beaters, and each other, allowed us to take in so much more of the experience. I loved sharing that experience with you. It was great, mate. Really good. The birds really put some effort in there, actually. Nice to see. The biggest thing is that you're not looking for the big flushes. You sat there wondering if, if you're going to get an opportunity, if it's going to be your turn, if it's going to be your chance, you know, and then when you see them come out of the crops, you can see the energy behind the bird. They're oh, a yeah. completely different beat. Huge birds yeah. and solid meat as well. It's not soft. I mean, these birds haven't set yet. They're still warm. The breasts on them are solid. I almost feel like it's the difference between forced fat and naturally grown fat. I'm looking forward to eating them. I wonder what the difference will be there. This wild pheasants is a new thing for me. And actually seeing the energy in flight 
really makes you think actually about what we do with reared stuff. Because if you could get your reared birds to fly half the energy that these things are oh, flying with. What the middle of the line had was... Yeah. Oh yeah. What Michael couldn't Michael. touch was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and the ground behind us is dipping away. So if anything, downhill is easy for them. It yeah. would be very easy for them to set their wings, glide down into that low bit of ground and disappear. But they were going across as if they're going the other side of that wood and the other hill. So this was my first driven wild bird day and I don't think I'll ever forget this one. And as you go around the estate, you can see the huge biodiversity gains for what they've done here. It's not just the game birds are thriving, it's the net gain of every other bird species and mammal species that are here. Although every one of us would have gone home ready to talk about this day for the rest of our lives, we were lucky to have one more drive. As we headed down onto the stubble, the beaters were bringing in the woods, covers and hedgerows that are in such abundance here. Having chased birds over these fields, I knew that driving these birds would take a heap of skill from the gamekeeper and his team. Our line of guns stretched a long way down the valley, but soon enough we were all pegged out. So interestingly, now that the fog's cleared, you can see a little bit more of the habitat work that's going on here, and it is just truly amazing. I mean, we're stood now currently on an overwinter stubble. It's obviously been taken out of the agricultural cycle in order to be left here for the birds over the winter period to give them somewhere to forage, somewhere to shelter, somewhere to dry off. There's, there's a little bit of everything in a winter stubble. That may be a small time of loss for a farm, but as far as conservation is concerned, it's, it's, it, you know, it's a huge gain. Um, looking around the field, you can see we've got what looks like either canary grass or wiscanthus on top of the hill. You know, that's going to be a great cover source year round. The hedges, when you look at a hedge, you can see that it hasn't been heavily managed. You know, it's not been smashed back like they do to try and keep productivity by pushing the hedges right in so you get every inch of a field. Coming out from that, you've got a metre of overgrown sedgy grass. That's giving you, you know, all the natural vetches, docks, things that would grow on that part of the field that the birds may need. It's going to help with the insect life. There's also then another couple of metre margin beyond that which is not within ag intensive agriculture, which has been left as a grass margin. That's going to give the birds somewhere to dry off. They are also the perfect habitat for insects. The UK's insect population has declined by 65% over the last 20 years. Insects are pivotal not only in their pollination roles, but in acting as a food source for young, wild birds. These little bad boys are the backbone of our ecosystem. If left pesticide free, these areas of weeds and wildflowers will be swarming with insects come spring. When we've been driving around the place, you can see that there's feeders on every hedgerow. You know, you've got 50 metres feeder, 50 metres feeder. And what that does, it, it gives each either cockbird or partridge cockbird the ability to have its own territory. So that 50 metres either side where each of those hoppers are, he will have one hopper. From that hopper, he will obviously display, he will gather his females, gives him his territory, it gives him what he needs to be able to breed. There's no signs of rats around any of these feeders. You know, they're obviously looking after everything and managing it to the nth degree. Right now where we are, if you look, it's a, it's a patchwork quilt. It's similar to what they do up on the grouse moors. You've got stubble here, you've got rape, you've got stubble turnips, you've got, you know, a, a real mix of crops around in one area which creates everything these birds need. I haven't had a job or a home since I come back from the war. I was doing all right. And now we can actually see from the fog, you can see the undulation here. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. And uh, it's just a real pleasure to be here, to be honest. I'm not laying in section 60 down in Arlington. If he comes, he's going to bend off, look. What a pest. <laughs> Wild birds for you. They know what's going on. These things are spectacular. Missed him. So that's what it's about, right? Missing him, hitting a few. And that's a wrap. That was a perfect end to an absolutely unbelievable day. I got beat by a couple of sneaky ones that knew where they were going, snuck out the side, shot a couple of nice ones over my right shoulder. Doesn't get any better than that. Those birds showing across that very medium sized valley were exceptional. And I think it just goes to show the quality that you get when you do it right. And I think that's what we're gonna take away from today. 
As with every drive, we all gathered to share our perspective of how the drive happened. It's a very small dot in the sky. <laughs> that came from probably 200 yards up that hedgerow. That's when I shouted it, when I said to you, yeah, no, I was like, like, big one coming down. When the birds come over in ones and twos, it really allows you to share in each other's shooting. And that enriches these post-drive conversations even more. Before we headed off to share a meal together, we made sure to thank the beaters for making a day like this possible. All too often, these heroes who make shoot days happen are forgotten in the post-shoot revelry. We saddled back up for one last drive the drive to lunch. The quality of the birds and the type of birds you see on a day like this are just incomparable to what you'd expect to see on a normal driven day. It's much closer to any kind of shooting over dogs that you do in America or a very different form of shooting than you'd see on a normal driven day. We finished our dinner and this day sadly drew to a close as we said our goodbyes and hit the road. A passion for hunting and the outdoors really is something that transcends social divides. New stories are woven, bridges are built, lives become intertwined and journeys of growth unfold in the crucible of our shared passion. But amidst the light-heartedness, there's always a quiet awareness of our responsibilities. It's important that we do not just take, but that we also give back. Beneath our boots lie not just our footprints, but a commitment to steward this land, ensuring a future not only for the flora and fauna that belongs here, but also for the sport we hold so dear to our hearts. Wild birds are our past, but they are also our future. My eternal thanks go to those who made this day possible. And to you for once again joining me on my journey. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day.